And uh, via telephone, Art Tom, who on uh, 100% of the previous occasions in which I introduced him, it was always as NRA lobbyist. But Art has a new title now. Arthur, good morning to you. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. You recently switched jobs, Arthur. I did. I did. I uh, I left the uh, National Rifle Association. Um, it's a great organization. Uh, fully support them. Life member. All of that. But uh, uh, look, the the anti gun left has taken the fight over to the uh, the manufacturers and the retailers, and uh, I I went over there to join them. Uh, and uh, I'm with the National Shooting Sports Foundation which is the Treaty Association for the Firearms Manufacturers, Retailers, and Ranges. All right, very good. That's a lot of business card space. <laughs> it is. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it's easy just to say I, uh, I work for the big boys now. <laughs> well, very good. Uh, Art, how long have you been in the industry in general? Have you counted your NRA time, and I think you were, what, the local director of the WBCDL for a while? I was vice president and lobbyist for the WVCDL for many years. Uh, so, and then with that, the NRA and now NSSF, uh, I've been in since 2007. 2007, okay. Uh, we wanted to talk to you this morning about a couple of decisions that recently have been uh, made by uh, the courts. One, the Supreme Court on Friday struck down the Trump era ban on bump stocks, and then we had a Texas court reverse the decision. On shoulder braces, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important we all understand what we're dealing with here. So if you could first, Art, explain bump stocks. I think many of us became familiar with them for the first time because of the deadly shooting in Las Vegas. Sure. So, uh, you know, a bump stock is just an accessory that, uh, you know, bolts onto the uh, the rear of a rifle. Uh, in most cases, uh, you know, a modern sporting rifle, AR-15 uh, type of thing. There's, uh, I, I believe they make some for uh, AK-47s as well. Not 100% sure, um, but either way, uh, what it does is it uses the uh, the action of the uh, of the firearm, the recoil, to uh, make the firearm shoot a little faster. But uh, it still does not change the actual operation of the firearm, which is what the Supreme Court ruled in this one um it's you still have to pull the trigger uh still one uh bullet is fired each time that you pull the trigger uh so it doesn't change the actual functionality of the firearm and the shoulder brace okay the shoulder brace is a uh you know for what was it 10 years 12 years can i step, uh, in, can I step in here real quick it's not a shoulder brace it's an arm brace no it's a it's an arm brace arm okay. brace. It's a, uh, it it actually, uh, in fact, a lot of times it has a, uh, the one that I have has a piece of Velcro that can strap around your forearm to, uh, to help stabilize the, uh, uh, you know, the, the rifle or the, uh, or the firearm, rather. Um, so what those are used for uh, most typically or, or what uh, it is helpful for are folks that, uh, that may not be able to um, use both hands uh, either due to a handicap or, or some other reason. And that, again, is why uh, that was uh, ruled that same way is because it doesn't say, uh, you know, you have to be able to, to shoulder the firearm or you have to be able to use it um, plus use your, your forearm or anything like that. You know, so both of them were, were in a similar reason. Um, now, that, uh, different from the bump stock uh, ruling, that was ruled in uh, – I believe three states, uh, maybe four states, that were uh, where that lawsuit was in play. Uh, that ruling specifically deals with those states. West Virginia is not one of them. But that being said, some of the organizations uh, that were included have members all across the country, uh, and the ATF isn't going to enforce the you know enforce the ban or the rule uh, beyond that, just because it would be intensely difficult to be able to do so so uh we we believe that the that that will not be enforced uh, across the country as well go ahead mr gilstrap well i just want to put this in perspective in in terms of the arm brace um it 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 literally it it looks like a stock it, it looks like something it, lo it looks like a rifle stock it's not what that is it, it's a it's a, a brace that you 
strap around your arm if if you just don't have the hand strength or the arm strength to, to, to hold the gun. And the, the problem with this ruling, <clears throat> when the Biden administration came in, I, hundreds of thousands of these things are around, uh, around the country. People, they're very popular. And the Biden administration made felons out of hundreds of thousands of people who legally bought these things. And overnight, um, if, you don't, if you don't turn them in, uh, you're, you're a felon which is absurd. And I right. think, uh, so this decision, I don't know the, the legal steps that were taken, but this is, this is a great relief, I think, for, for many folks that now don't have to hide, <laughs> hide this legally purchased product uh, out of sight. Absolutely. You're 100% correct. Bill? Yeah. Good morning, Art. Uh, Art, uh, with a uh, with a bump stocks, uh, uh, President Trump, uh, uh, we used an executive order said that they could not be used, utilized, and NRA supported that at the time. Uh, no, now, no, no, I'm sorry. No, they did not support. Not it. Okay. No, no. So there was a uh, that is a a gross misunderstanding um, that the NRA supported that. What happened? was a former employee who just happened to be um, in an executive uh, position or a, man a managing director position, uh, Chris Cox. He put out a video where he supported the idea of a bump stock ban. Uh, he was shortly thereafter uh, separated from the NRA, and um, you know that was never the NRA's position. And, and I know myself and my colleagues – personally across the country fought against the bump stock bans uh, and continue to do so. Well, you've answered my, my, my question then. Uh, the Congress is thinking about trying to uh, implement a regulation against bump stocks, uh, and I assume that both the NRA and the uh, Gun Makers Association will be opposed to this, this congressional action? Yes. Okay. Yes. What? So, and and you make a you bring up a good point, um, though that's that's important here. You know, although this is a uh, Second Amendment win, uh, this isn't a Second Amendment case. Uh, you know, whenever it comes down to it, um, you know, this decision was it didn't say that a state uh, or that Congress cannot ban that accessory. It said that the ATF. Uh, way overstepped their bounds uh, in exceeding its statutory authority by issuing a rule that classifies bump stocks as machine guns when, in fact, they're not. And the court went on to, you know, that uh, to, to find that semi-automatic rifle equipped with a bump stock cannot fire more than one shot by the single function of a trigger, which is what creates a machine gun. Um, and they said, look, you do not have the authority to create this rule. Yeah, I, and I think that's that's the victory here. Um, I personally, I'm a gun guy. I have no time for bump stocks. Um, I think that all shots should be aimed. Uh, after after the first shot with a bump stock, you don't. In my case, I've used these things. I don't know where the other ones are going. You know, let's say out on a farm and you and you just want to fire into the woods. That's my personal opinion. But I'm very much in favor of the Supreme Court's ruling here because words mean things and laws mean things. And Congress decided, defined what a fully automatic weapon was. And that is that, you know, a single pull of the trigger fires with the, through the operation of the sear, op, it just fires multiple rounds at the same time. That's not what a bump stock does. What a bump stock does is it facilitates multiple single pulls of the trigger. So the, an executive branch enforcement agency should not be able to, I mean, just as a matter of principle, whether it's EPA or it's AT, ATF, a, a, an executive branch enforcement agency should not be able to rewrite the language of Congress. And I think Congress should, whether it's ATF or it's EPA or OSHA or anything else, I think Congress needs to start stepping up and taking credit or blame for sp the specific regulations that that they're enforcing, and I think that the, that the Supreme Court is leaning more and more that way. So if I would have personally, and you know, this is just, this is just John, I would have no problem if Congress wanted to regulate 
uh, bump stocks and say that, no, you, you can't have them. But they have to step up and do that and have that fight during an election year. And they're not going to do it because they're too cowardly to do that. So it, you, you can't palm that off on an agency that will the, – the executive branch is going to change with the next election – and you're just jerking the public around because the next ATF will say the, the Trump ATF, you go to the wrist braces, the uh, Trump ATF said that they were fine after the Obama administration said they weren't. So you know, you're kind of jerking people around, and that should not be the responsibility of an executive branch agency. That is the purview of Congress. Right. And, and to your point, um, right, a, a bureaucrat, uh, an unelected bureaucrat should never be able to create law. Um, or you know uh, a rule that that puts potentially people in jail, especially you know as a felony. But you know again, the ATF had ruled for what 10, 12 years that these bump stocks were fine, and then all of a sudden uh, the Biden administration gets in and they decide these are now not fine. And uh, you know. And and that was uh, well, I guess it was Trump administration that, that originally put it out, and then the Biden administration came through. Biden administration came through with the pistol braces, and uh, you know both of them both of them were wrong. You know the uh, when the uh, the Trump administration said it, it was wrong. Uh, when the uh, when the um, Biden administration backed that up as well as the uh, the pistol braces again, that was wrong. And the Supreme Court ruled correctly here, and again, not that it cannot be covered. You know, to your point, John, uh, Congress can act if they if they so desire, um, but the bureaucrats cannot do it. Hey, when we when we talk, we're talking different terminology: or pistol braces, wrist braces, shoulder braces. We're all talking about the same thing, are we not? We are, there, are. are there just slight differences, or is it just different terminology? It's just different terminology. It's it's a uh, the uh, the arm brace or pistol brace, whatever you want to call it. It's the uh, it's the same it's the same thing. Uh, I, can Go Go Dylan, can can he pull up something and, and put it up? Yeah, Dylan, if you want to get a picture of something Dylan, like can that. you pull up? Uh, it's going to be either a SIG brace or a, a pistol brace on the Internet and, and, and put it up. In the meantime, Art, while well, Dylan's doing that, because that's going to take a moment to get that uh, saved and brought across, uh, David Valente has a question on our Facebook page, which is a pretty good question, I think. Does Art believe the drug question on the federal firearms application is a violation of your Second and Fifth Amendment rights? <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, any, what he's talking about, for anybody that doesn't know, is uh, marijuana use and uh, firearms. And uh, when it comes down to marijuana use and, uh, and firearms, that is an issue that, again, has to be taken up by the uh, federal administration because that's where that, that drug is, uh, is classified. Right now it's classified as a Schedule I narcotic, which is the same as heroin or, 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 uh, or cocaine. Um, and is that – do I agree with that? No. No, I, I don't agree that it should be a Schedule I narcotic. Uh, you know, fentanyl is actually scheduled lower than – than, than marijuana. Uh, you know, do I believe that marijuana has some recreational uh, capabilities? Sure. Uh, recreationally, recreationally um, do I believe that it is uh, any worse than, uh, than alcohol consumption? I, I struggle, you know, to believe that. Um, do I, uh, you know, partake in it? I do not. Does it annoy me? Tremendously, especially when I'm trying to walk around with my family in New York City and you can't step off of any curb without going into a, a, a cloud of it. But that being said, um, should you lose your constitutional rights um, or pick and choose which constitutional rights you lose because uh, of your use of, of, especially in the state of West Virginia and several other states, medicinal marijuana, um, no, I, I don't believe that that should be the case. Um, I believe you know, the Trump administration said – well, no, the Obama administration said they were going to reclassify marijuana, and they did not. The Trump administration said they were going to reclassify marijuana. They also did not. The uh, Biden administration, coming close to an election like it is every time, is now floating the idea that it's taking it down to a Schedule Three at least. So that will at least make it where you don't lose your, your constitutional rights or your rights to, to possess a firearm. Um, medicinally, you can have them and, and things of that nature. Or it says that it does have some medicinal uh, 
capabilities. So uh, do I agree with it? I, I don't. Um, but that's not something that the NRA, NSSF, uh, or uh, GOA, or NAGR, that's not the gun lobby's uh, role. Uh, that is where the, you know, the marijuana lobby or whoever's going to handle that needs to, to have that uh, push to have that reclassified because understand, uh, although you know, some folks might, may not like it and may not necessarily uh, agree, but understand – if we were to lobby to say, hey, you should be able to uh, partake in this product and still have your constitutional rights, if we were to fight that battle under its current uh, classification, we would also be saying heroin, cocaine, uh, and whatever else that's under the Schedule One uh, narcotics you should be able to use. Um, it's real difficult to, to, um, to separate those for our own uh, pleasure. This question, of course, uh, very much in the news to the Hunter Biden case uh, as well. Uh, here's another question for you, Art, uh, from J.R. Fox. I'm a huge gun advocate and the right to bear arms, but why do we need bump stocks and high-capacity magazines? Okay, well, I'm going to start with the second one first. Um, it's a standard-capacity magazine, and I don't know what uh, actually a high-capacity would be. I'm assuming what they're talking about is a standard magazine that is issued or uh, – that is, uh, you know, comes with a, uh, a purchased uh, AR-15 or uh, AK-47 type of uh, a firearm. Um, that's just a standard magazine. It's not high capacity. Um, but uh, when you talk about your, your modern sporting rifles, these are firearms that are used on a daily basis uh, in sporting matches and, and things of that nature. And this isn't a uh, a, a firearm where you can have five, six, seven. I mean, I don't know what what they want, what what their, uh, you know, what their version of standard capacity is. But it is thirty round magazine is the, is the standard capacity. But uh, at the same time, that or the bump stock, why not? I, I, you know, it's not like there are millions and millions of these uh, magazines out in a play. Heck, I. I have, I don't know, maybe a hundred of them myself. And uh, it's not like these things are, are, are hurting people. In fact, and I know that they talk about it, and they're like, well, in, the, in these mass shootings, that this happens and that happens. And if you look at these mass shootings where these uh, type of uh, magazines were in play, they're usually not dumped. They usually have rounds in them where they're dropping them and reloading before they even have spent the magazine that they that – they, uh, originally had um and it's uh so it it doesn't make sense that's like asking me you know you can you can drive a ford focus why do we need a corvette why do we need a lamborghini it's just absurd the standard person can't drive that you weren't trained to drive that when you were 16 years old why do you need that it's nonsense our Tom is our guest, uh, Firearms Industry Trade Association now. We're formerly with the uh, NRA. Bill, did you have a comment? Yeah, uh, Rob, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Tom, how does your job change going from uh, NRA to the uh, Gun Mech Association? Yep, so from NRA to National Shooting Sports Foundation, um, it's uh, basically the same job. I'm still uh, uh, overseeing government affairs um, where – under the NRA, uh, my focus was the uh, more on the civil rights side, um, you know, and, and wildly we were wildly successful. Passed um, near not, I mean, there's still work that can be done, but near every every bill that could be had in West Virginia, we've taken care of. Um, and now, like some of the bills that we've had this past couple of years, um, like the merchant category codes uh, ban that we passed here in the state of West Virginia and several, several other states um, that says that credit card companies cannot track your firearms purchases through the merchant category code. That's the type of stuff we'll fight for. Uh, firearms industry non-discrimination uh, act where, uh, you know, banks and uh, financial institutions cannot um, discriminate against uh, an industry or a business simply because they're in the, uh, the world of, of firearms or ammunition, and if they do so, you know the state can uh, cannot 
honor contracts or cannot have contracts with them themselves, similar to ESG uh, that we have here in the state of West Virginia. Um, we'll, we fight for that kind of stuff. We fight against uh, the bans on modern, modern sporting rifles and you know red flag laws and, and, and things of that nature. Um, we fight for uh, better business climates in states to uh, attract uh, firearms manufacturers and ammunition manufacturers and ranges and retail locations to those states um, to provide uh, a better opportunity for all of us, right? A better opportunity to be able to uh, have jobs manufacturing firearms or ammunition, uh, jobs at these, uh, at these retailers and ranges, uh, opportunities to be able to purchase firearms um, locally uh, and then go to the range and train and, uh, and uh, also uh, use it as a, again, as, as sporting. Um, so it's a, uh, that's, what, that's what I'll be focused on now. Is uh, is more the business side, and uh, and ensuring that uh, you know we bring opportunities to the states that uh, that we get from uh, the firearms industry. You know, I think there's a fundamental disconnect, and I, it's maybe it's a problem with with school curricula. I don't know, but the first ten amendments of the Constitution are the Bill of Rights. They are the the rights. They're the natural rights of America, of Americans, Americans. They are they are not granted by the government. These are the rights that are granted by God, the, the ones that the rights with which we are born. Among those is the right to keep and to bear arms, the right to freedom of speech, the right you know the uh, run through all ten amendments of the Bill of Rights. The, the government does not give us the rights to keep and bear arms. What the Second Amendment does is prevent the government from infringing with the natural right to keep and to bear arms. It's a very, very high bar. And I, I think the whole language of the debate needs to be changed. If, in fact, all of these changes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Facebook feed that, uh, where, where people are getting kind of heated. All you have to do is repeal the Second Amendment. All you have to do is have uh, run it through Congress and get, what is it, three-quarters of the states to agree that that right is not a natural right and take away the Second Amendment. It's not going to happen. Why? Because, because it's not going to happen. So to regulate through the courts or to regulate through the executive branch is, is just, it's unconstitutional, and that's what we're seeing right now. And right, we've, we've got about a minute left here, and then we have to wrap it up. Art, do you see the Texas decision being appealed to the Supreme Court? Uh, I, I don't believe I don't believe so. But if it does, awesome. You know, I think that would be uh, that. There's there's not a problem with that. I, I see that the uh, the Supreme Court ruling, um, in our favor on that again as well. Um, it just, uh, it, you know, it's, and then again, you know, as uh, as John pointed out, um, it, in I think by the time that the uh, uh, that it would get to the Supreme Court, um, depending on uh, on how the elections go, um, it would be it would be changed anyway. But it doesn't. We, it still, if they decide to take it that way, it would still need to go there. Um, even if uh, if they if they do it, the Supreme Court, we still would want them to hear it. Be, even if uh, you know the Trump administration was to come in and, and reverse it, because again, as John pointed out. It's flip flop back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, we, and you can't do that. You can't have people uh, all over the place. Art, appreciate your time this morning as always. Hey, anytime. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Have a great day, sir.